Emil Cadillac here with FantasyNation.com. We have a special guest today, Ron Chandler. He is definitely a fantasy sports pioneer. He started in the fantasy business in the mid-1980s, late-1980s. That's fantastic. Ron, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's nice and sunny here in Florida in the middle of uh, spring training. It uh, couldn't be better. Yeah, so you have you gone to see some games? Uh, yeah, oh, of course. I, I, I live about 10 minutes from the uh, the Mets spring training facility here in Port St. Lucie, so I have season tickets to uh, all the spring training games, and I usually get to go to probably about 8 or 10 of them. It's, uh, it's a great time down here. That's fantastic. Weather and baseball. Neat. Mm -hmm. So tell me about when you were young, how you, you know, got what you got in, what sports you got into, and how you evolved from there. Well, uh, to be honest, when I was a, a young boy, a young lad, I was not even remotely a sports fan, um, which was odd because I grew up in a, a really big New York Yankees uh, household. All my family, my dad, my, my uncles, my cousins, everybody were devout Yankee fans. I didn't get it when I was a kid. Um, I went to my first baseball game in Yankee Stadium back in like 1964, 65, and all I was concerned about was having another hot dog. I just really didn't get it. But uh, things changed um, in 1969 when the Mets were suddenly doing something magical, and all my friends in school had just caught Mets fever, and I wanted to be a part of that. And I remember uh, during the World Series that year in my um, – in my English class, the English teacher did not hold a class on the, on the last day of the World Series, and she had a transistor radio in the middle of the classroom, and the entire class was sitting around listening to the ball game and listening to Cleon Jones make that final catch. The Mets became the world champions, and the place just exploding with excitement. And uh, suddenly I was like, oh, this sounds like something I should probably uh, learn more about. And the following spring, it was actually my younger brother, um, my younger brother Marty, who just uh, recently passed away. He he was watching a Mets game on TV and said, look at those numbers at the bottom of the screen. You know, Tommy Agee, his home runs, RBIs, batting average. And I was always a stat geek. I mean, that was who I was. I was always into numbers. And once I saw those numbers and connected me to the sport, that's when things took off. And I, that, at that point, I became a huge baseball fan. Wow. So, 69, you were about 12 years old. Right. And uh, it kept evolving. So, when was the, the moment that you found out about, you know, fantasy sports? 1984. Um, that summer, uh, I was in a bookstore. I was living in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire at that point, uh, working in the tallest building in the state, Manchester. And in the basement of that building was a was a, um, a Dalton Books bookstore, and in the back, it was July, it was the discount rack, there were two books I bought that day, Bill James Baseball Abstract, which I had never seen before, and the Rotisserie, Rotisserie League Baseball book, the little green book that was first published by uh, uh, Glenn Wagner and Dan Okrent. And my world changed at that point. Um, I was always a, a big baseball fan, but seeing you know the advanced statistics that Bill James was doing and being able to play a game like that, um, so uh, I was enamored by the whole concept of, of fantasy, of rotisserie back then. And but it was the middle of the baseball season, so I couldn't start a league. I got a bunch of my friends uh, together and said, "Well, we should try to do something with this." And so. My very first fantasy experience was a hockey league. Uh, I grew up in New Hampshire. Hockey was big. And the very first player I ever drafted in any fantasy was Tom Barrasso of the Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys create that league, or did you find it somewhere? Yeah, we created it. It was actually only six of us, because that's the only people at that point, uh, at that point who were uh, – willing to give this thing a shot, and we had so much fun playing that hockey league that winter that uh, uh, the following spring we started the, the Baseball Association of the Granite State. <laughs> That's great stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you just do it by hand, like, you know, on a, some kind of a system? Or yeah, it, it was mostly by hand back then. Uh, USA Today uh, was publishing the American League statistics on Tuesday and the National League statistics on Wednesday. And we take a yellow highlighter and mark the pages and then just uh, 
type in, uh, in uh, basically, I was using, I think, Lotus 1.2.3 version 1 or something yeah. like that. Just one of the earliest spreadsheets. And, um, yeah, on my, uh, let's see, on my uh, IBM uh, uh, PC, personal computer, with uh, which I thought was incredible, 10 megabyte hard drive. A 10 megabyte hard drive. I couldn't believe I had a 10 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> and we could do all those things with it. Uh, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was six of us, so I, I'd print out the stats, and uh, I'd, we'd get together, and we'd share the numbers and look at how all of us were doing. That's pretty pretty rudimentary back then. So what was the next step? The next step was um, I was a, a voracious reader, so after I was taking in all the Bill James stuff, there was another book called The Hidden Game of Baseball, a Pete Palmer wrote, and uh, Thomas Boswell, a uh, columnist, wrote a book called uh, How Life Begins uh, on Opening Day, and he talked about uh, one of his statistical gauges that he was uh, uh, writing about, and I was, I was looking at these three books, and I was saying, well, Bill James is doing one thing, Pete Palmer is doing something else, and Thomas Boswell is doing something else. It would be interesting to take a look to see how their player analyses uh, stacked up against each other, side by side by side. So in uh, the fall of 1986, I decided to uh, take out my trusty Lotus 123 work uh, spreadsheet and type in all the stats for all the players and set up the calculations for runs created, for total uh, total average, and linear weights, which were the three uh, gauges that the, the three metrics that the, were being published. And I put a little one-inch ad in the Sporting News. I forget how much it cost me uh, to sell this this little, basically this folder with all these sheets of uh, rosters with the statistics. And I sold, I don't know, maybe about 60 or 70 of them at $10 a piece. I thought, well, maybe there's something here. So the following year I did it again, and then I sold about 120 of them. And suddenly um, I started getting letters from people saying, it would be great if you did projections. And at the time, I was actually a sales uh, forecasting analyst for a, a publishing company up in Boston. And I was like, wait a second, I do this for a living. I can, I can take these formulas I use and apply it to baseball. And so that's what I did in, in 1988, uh, I believe it was the first set of projections that I published in this book. And then it just took off. The baseball forecaster uh, now we just published our thirty-fourth annual edition. Oh my God! Um, yeah, it's it's basically it's 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 become my uh, my life. Well, you you may have been the first fantasy projector out there because I know, and uh, I did the Pro Forecast magazine in nineteen ninety, and that it's forecast Pro Forecast. We forecasted what the players would do that year statistically. So that was multi years after you started doing projections. Emil, it's amazing how long we've been doing this. It's just, uh, can, can you imagine? No, it's interesting because I've, I've done many of these, uh, these interviews like we're doing right now, and it, you know, it finally hit me. Uh, a guy emailed me and says, you know, it's incredible how we've been doing this for 30-plus years, and I'm like, it is 30 years. That's a long yeah. time. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> a long time. So, yeah, so 87 is when you started your, your, your well, was it 86 or 87 you started your business? It was 86. The fall of 86 was the first, uh, yeah, first edition of the Baseball Forecaster. Yeah. Wow. That's mm -hmm. incredible. And I, you've got a bunch of stuff going out. Now, tell me about the Sabre. Uh, how did you get into that, and, and who started that thing? Uh, the Society for American Baseball Research. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was started way before my time. Um, I joined the organization back in the mid-1980s, I think 85, just to uh, be part of was, was looking at these advanced metrics in different ways of, of uh, uh, examining the game and researching the game. Um, so it's a large organization that uh, I've been a part of for a very long time, and uh, they, they've been around. Bill James was part of it. Oh, okay. But they, at the time, were they into the fantasy of, the, of baseball or just studying baseball? Yeah, they were not into fantasy. They never, never actually really embraced fantasy baseball, uh, even to this day. They, really? they, uh, yeah, they're a very serious organization. And I give them a lot of credit. They've they've done a, a ton of research 
uh, for the game to help us understand it better. And uh, for that, uh, nobody can take that away from them. But uh, fantasy was something that it was it was different. I guess. But is, isn't there a Saber Fantasy League, or am I missing that? No, I don't believe so. No, it's just there, there are tra- yeah trade organizations that uh, do the fantasy too. The Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association does uh, fantasy leagues and, and like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I saw something where you said you finished third place in the Labor NL in 97. Oh, that's different. Yeah, the, the League of Alternative Baseball oh, I'm sorry. Reality. Yeah, that's LABR. Sorry. When did L-A-B-R. that Tell us about how that got started. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 1994, uh, John Hunt, who was the fantasy, the rotisserie of fantasy sport, uh, baseball columnist for Baseball Weekly, um, he was uh, pitched this idea by... Um, Jerry Heath, who, run, he, who ran the, uh, a commissioner service, Heath Research, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, that uh, Jerry pitched to him that he would uh, be the official commissioner service for this league if, if uh, John could get together a bunch of the top analysts and writers in, in fantasy baseball and uh, create this experts league. So uh, John bought into it, and we had that first draft uh, auction in 1994. Now picture this. This was before widespread use of the internet. Maybe half of us even had email addresses back then. So there was really no online presence. So this auction was conducted via conference call. In 94? In 94, I swear. I remember I was sitting in my tiny office in the basement of my townhouse. And I had my ear to the phone because I didn't even have a speaker phone back then. And I sat and conducted this auction for seven and a half hours. Wow. It started like seven in the evening, and it was two o'clock or thereabouts in the morning when this thing finally wrapped up. And that was the first labor draft. I mean, wow. uh, Bill James was in it. Uh, 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 Keith Olbermann was, was in it. Uh, all of these heavy hitters were in it. And it, uh, it was a, an amazing experience. They, they they're still doing the labor draft. This past weekend in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, here, we had the 27th annual labor draft. So, so uh, it That's started. Uh, incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, did they use auction? Oh yeah. Still. Uh, rotisserie, yeah, rotisserie baseball started as an auction league, um, and uh, it continues that way. I mean, we've added the snake drafts because you know most people play that now. It's an easier way to do it online, but. Uh, this this hobby on the baseball side started as auction leagues. Yeah, I remember that. And <clears throat> you know, personally, I like auction better. I might not be very good at it, but I like it better because you get you know for obviously you get shots at players. It's a little more complicated, so it's more of a challenge, and you have a chance to you know do better. But you know, I'm glad to see auction still going. In in football, I don't think it'll ever get bigger than like 10% because people are scared of it. And, it, and they can not prepare for a draft and just serpentine, just grab a cheat sheet and do pretty well. But you're about to say something. Yeah. You. you know, football is great in that it doesn't have to interrupt your life. <laughs> yeah. For a lot of people it does. But baseball is, you have to be pretty intense to, to be able to stick with it for, uh, you know, six months. Well, I wonder, you know, baseball was so huge compared, fantasy baseball was so huge compared to fantasy football. And then you had the baseball strike and, Somewhere it kind of flipped, and I'm wondering if what you just said is a reason why, because you can play fantasy football, and it doesn't necessarily uh, interrupt your life as, as much as the baseball side of things. I think part of it also is that once uh, more, more people had access online, um, snake drafts were easier to do online. Auctions, we didn't have the software to support auctions. Uh, and since fantasy baseball back in the 90s was primarily auction leagues, it kind of took a back seat to football where uh, it was a lot easier to do these snake drafts online. So what happened? And then there was the tout wars. What? Uh, tell me about mm-hmm. how that got created. Well, uh, labor was going on for the first few years, and a bunch of us who had been in the labor leagues, um, uh, it was it was a it was a difficult situation. Uh, Baseball Weekly, USA Today, were basically they were running these leagues. And the first year or two, they would uh, run these leagues, and then in their, uh, in their uh, newspaper, in the magazine, they would uh, put the results of these drafts, and we get little postage ch- stamp-sized pictures of ourselves and the names of our organizations and the contact information. 
and the contact information was was really the key thing that uh, allowed us to have exposure to the public through this publication and we were thrilled that we were getting that exposure but each successive year they started doing this they started pulling back more and more you know the first year instead of uh, our, our 800 numbers they just put the names of our organizations then our pictures went away and by the fourth year uh, we were uh, paying our own way to go to the draft because at that point we there was no more conference calls there were live drafts we were paying our way to go to these uh, drafts and not getting anything out of it uh, they were not putting our contact information and uh, we contacted the the honchos at, at the baseball weekly and their attitude is like if you want an ad you know if you want promotion buy an ad and um, so a bunch of us said well we, we need to form a, a, an entity where we can take control we can have control over um, promoting ourselves and doing it uh, a way that uh, makes sense for us and so we created the second experts league called Tap Wars started in 1998 uh, we had a huge uh, opening ceremony we we, at, uh, we had the very first draft at the the all-star cafe in midtown Manhattan where we had uh, you know an audience gallery area and all this promotion and uh, uh, this all-star cafe became the ESPN zone it was uh, just a huge thing and so we had the big splash at the beginning and Tower Wars became you know a second experts league and that as well has been uh, uh, carried on to this day so have you had the uh, the draft for it yet this year uh, coming up next weekend uh, again in midtown Manhattan uh, this would be our uh, 23rd year I think yeah the <laughs> 23rd year that's fantastic mm -hmm. Going back a couple of years, the internet started to get more popular, and you created uh, BaseballHQ.com. Tell yeah. me about that. Uh, sure. Um, during the most of the 1990s, I was publishing a monthly uh, hard copy newsletter that I'd mail out each month, and uh, had a fairly decent following. Had about I don't know, maybe about a thousand subscribers. But there were, there was a lot of competition back then, and I was looking for to uh, kind of get an edge over the competition. And so uh, as the Internet started taking hold more and more, uh, I first started trying to disseminate the, uh, the information via email. Um, and that was difficult because uh, the publication had a lot of charts and spreadsheets, and at that point, sending attachments via e email was, was very difficult. So I spent the summer of uh, 1996 learning HTML. I taught myself HTML and created uh, the first... Um, first edition of back then was Baseball Forecaster Online, which uh, several months later morphed into BaseballHQ.com. And uh, at that time, I had, um, I was working with uh, Rick Wilton, who was, uh, he had his own business for a while. A strike happened in 1994. Uh, unfortunately, his, his organization went under, but he had several products that I thought were just wonderful. Um, he had um, basically a news service where he had people in all the major league cities sending him in. And so that was something I didn't have. Um, so I, I wanted to keep that. So I took that under my wing. And he did the first uh, fantasy baseball conference in 1994. And I thought that was a really neat idea, too. So I took those products and Rick under my umbrella at that point and we created BaseballHQ.com. So he did a lot of the news analysis. I stuck to the projections and the statistics and, and the strategy type stuff. Um, and uh, 1996 was when that started. So go back to this baseball conference in 94. Was that, uh, tell me more about that. Yeah, Rick thought it would be great to uh, have uh, bring in all these speakers event where readers of our material would get to talk to us and answer questions. We could do presentations. So um, he formed this, this baseball conference uh, in Arizona in coordination with the Arizona Fall League that had just started uh, several years prior, which was like the last instructional league before players would make the jump to the majors. It was sort of like the last stop. And it was funny, um, he and uh, he did a, a great job of trying to prove this back then, but he, he was faced with uh, an unfortunate situation in that the players went on strike. 
So here it is, the fall of 94, and there's no baseball going on. All it is is a lot of lawyers arguing with each other, and he's trying to do this conference. And you know, there were several times where I said, Rick, just bag this thing. Just, it just really doesn't make a lot of sense. But he said, no, we need to have a starting point. So whatever we get, we get. And the, the running joke with this whole thing was that the comment on, there were 13 speakers and eight attendees. <laughs> <laughs> now, was this, we did it. Yeah, was this conference baseball or did it mix into fantasy at all? It was fantasy baseball. It fantasy was strictly baseball. it was fantasy baseball. We were trying to do a tie-in with the, the ball games that were going on in Arizona in, in uh, October and November. So uh, with the conference, you got tickets to like three or four ball games too. So we'd have seminar sessions in the morning and ball games in the afternoon. And uh, eventually this just exploded too. I mean, we were, we were past our 20th anniversary of doing First Pitch Arizona. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of time. Now I noticed here it says that you um, you took it over in '96 from uh, right. Fantasy Sports Journal. Was that what Rick was? That's that's what Rick was. Yeah. Wow. So uh, yes, we uh, we took it over, rebranded it as First Bet, First Pitch Arizona, and um, it just took a very slow growth over time. But it was our our attitude was as long as this covers our expenses, we're going to keep doing this. And it, um, it started making money at some point, but really the, the point wasn't to, for this to be a profit center. The point was this was to be an industry event where we'd bring in people from you know, all the media centers and have a chance to network and talk and, and pr provide information to our readers. And uh, that's what we do now. We, we, we still do this three-day event in Arizona. And this past weekend, we're, we've now expanded to do spring training in Florida. Um, so uh, wow. it's yeah, it's become an industry events, and uh, I'm very pleased that this expands at this point. So it's somewhat business to business, but you still have fans that uh, that come to it. Exactly. exactly. I remember uh, Lenny Milnick told me that uh, he came to one of yours in Arizona and met his future wife there. Do you know that yes, story? Though? Yes, I do. He and Andrea. <laughs> so uh, I guess I have that claim to fame too. <laughs> yeah, that was a great story about about your 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 conference because yeah. and he told me he was was talking to this this lady over you know some informa you know some instant messaging system, and he said, "Well, I won't be around next week. I've got something to do." And she goes, "Yeah, me too." And he said, "Well, where are you going?" She says, "Well, I'm going to you know the Ron Chandler conference," and I'm like, mm. "Well, I am too." <laughs> <laughs> and so he picked her up at the airport, and the rest is history. That's incredible. Yes, so yes, you actually created something like the FSTA way before the FSTA, if I may make that conjecture. Uh, well, I don't know. I think the FSTA was always intended to be a business-to-business -business, uh, type of deal. Um, I think my, my original focus was it was, it was a B2C. It was business-to-consumer. The focus was on our readers and, and providing them information. And... Um, the business aspect sort of evolved from that when people saw that they could have access to their same customers through this venue as well. So yeah. then folks were sending people from ESPN and, you know, uh, MLB and, and, and like that. So did you ever go to, or did you go to the fantasy sports uh, convention in the Tropicana in 1998? At the Tropicana? Yeah. No, I don't think I was that. I was, I was at, uh, um, the FSTA, originally FSPA, yes. uh, back in the late 90s, yes, uh, there, was, uh, there was a conference at uh, this golf resort in Orlando. I was at that one. Uh -huh. uh, some of the, yeah, I was at some of the early ones, and then, you know, more recently when they've been to Las Vegas. So you've done a lot of different things here. You said you also launched uh, Roto HQ in 2001. Yeah, you know, once once we were up on the internet, there were so many things that we could have done. I, I decided that let's let's see what we can do by um, launching a site with basically evergreen strategy articles, uh, material that people could use just to help them win their leagues from a strategic basis. So, uh, Roto HQ was um, uh, basically just a library. It was just a, a static library. We, we'd add material to it each year as we wrote uh, articles for Baseball HQ. And, uh, you know, that was fine for a while. And it, it ended, ultimately, it just ended up getting folded back into Baseball HQ. He asked, I was wondering if, why not just put that on Baseball HQ from the yeah. outset? But 
Yeah, I guess I, I, I thought maybe that we create a different uh, revenue stream from uh, a different type of uh, content. It makes sense to me. <laughs> I got a couple of websites too. Mm -hmm. So tell me more. You've got a lot of things going on shortly after there. Uh, what's the? You started to get involved with some of the big names, ESPN, etc. Yeah, I mean uh, the the. the Major media sites were always looking for uh, new content, so uh, you know, we, we had an arrangement with CBS back in the early 2000s for content. Uh, in 2007, uh, we were providing content to ESPN.com and ESPN the magazine. Uh, so you know, my approach with the website was always to try to publish a material that people couldn't get anywhere else. And, and the biggest challenge was that because I had always produced a subscription-based product, you know, the books, the newsletters, I had never had any intention of making Baseball HQ a free website, even though that's how most websites were going on the web, with, as offering information for free. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, the big challenge was trying to justify asking people to open their wallets for the material we were publishing. So it had to be exclusive, it had to be stuff that it couldn't get anywhere else, and it had to be good. The quality had to be excellent, better than excellent. So I had a very rigorous process for hiring writers. And, and by the early 2000s, uh, I had about 20 or 30 writers contributing to the site. Uh, but wow. they all had to go through this, this process to, to make sure that they met the quality standards I had set because I knew that people would not pay for this unless they knew it was the best that they could get anywhere else. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, my attitude was like, you know, a lot of these major media sites were hiring uh, writers who played fantasy baseball. I was looking for successful fantasy baseball players who knew how to write. And I think that distinction is what separated, separated us out a lot from a lot of the sites that were out there. Wow. That's, that's really good. Just quickly back, I forgot to ask you, you said you did a lot of simulator. You were a simulation gamer since 71. Which simulation <laughs> games were you playing? I started with these little spinner games, Kadako All-Star Baseball, where the player cards were these little circular cards, and you'd put them in the spinner, and you'd spin it, and they'd tell you whether you hit a home run or strikeout. Oh, wow. And when I was a teenager, that was like the coolest thing. And then I graduated, you know, people graduated to Stratomatic. I never got into Stratomatic. I, I was into APBA, uh, which was a competitor of Stratomatic. Oh, really? Dice rollers. Yeah. Yeah, so that was not quite as big as Stratomatic, but so I played simulation uh, games with that, and we'd create leagues, and, um, you know, fantasy is really just a simulation game done in real time for the most part, so uh, it, was, it was a natural progression for me. Yeah, that makes sense. So tell me about your books, which, uh, you know, give me a review of those. Well, Baseball HQ, uh, Baseball Forecaster, rather, uh, is... is is still uh, the the, uh, the foundation of, of, of what I do. Uh, it, it's you know I it's at the point now at this stage of my career where you know, it's I'm I'm not as bigger a contributor to that as I used to be. Obviously in the early days and, and starting in the uh, 2003 2004 there was just so much information I, I recognized that there was no way I could do this myself. So I started farming out pieces of it. So uh, it's, it's really a group effort now. And uh, the editors, Ray Murphy and Brent Hershey, uh, have done an incredible job of, of, of keeping this process going uh, that, you know, we're basically one of the very few published hard copy ink on paper uh, vehicles that, that people can buy to help them uh, understand baseball better and, and do better in their fantasy league. So, so that's, that's, go ahead. Um, when does that usually come out each year? It uh, comes out every year in the fall, usually early December. One of the things that really helped sales in the early days is recognizing that uh, people bought these as Christmas gifts for their, you know, wives would buy for their husbands as Christmas gifts, so stocking stuffers. And so we uh, always tried to get the book out before Christmas. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a preseason book, per se, for the season. It was different than that. Well, you know, in the early days, it was actually called the Baseball Forecaster Annual Review. Uh, so it was positioned originally as a review of the previous season. But uh, since more and more people were buying it for the projections, it made sense to reposition it as uh, a preseason annual. And even though 
it came out so early. Uh, we, we offer updates in March. So if you bought the book, you could uh, you automatically get an online update to the projections in March. So we, this way, it allowed us to keep it as current as we could. Oh, okay. That's good. So did you also do some work with USA Today? Yeah. Um, we uh, I wrote for USA Today for from 2008 to 2014, I guess. Um, so I, my columns were in the newspaper, were online. Uh, Baseball HQ and USA Today have had a very close relationship uh, since 2008, which was when I actually sold my company to uh, Fantasy Sports Ventures, which eventually flipped it to USA Today. So, uh, so we've always had a very close relationship since then. There's been a lot of uh, uh, content going back and forth. So you're still under the umbrella of uh, USA Today's system? Yes. Yes, we are. Fantastic. Yeah, that, they, they bought a lot of companies. I forget exactly when the year was, but that was a big evolution there. Um, what is Fantasyland? <laughs> Fantasyland. Um, yeah. Yeah, back in, gosh, 2003, 2004, uh, Sam Walker, who was a sports editor at the Wall Street Journal, was writing a book. Um, he wanted to write a book about um, fantasy baseball uh, from a historical perspective. I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to think back to his original pitch to me because he contacted me and he gave me a, a vague explanation of what he was trying to do and asked if he could join Tout Wars. Now, um, Tout Wars really was, it's an expert's league. There was uh, requirements for you to be in Tout Wars. But he thought that it would be interesting for somebody who had never played fantasy before. He was a complete rookie, a complete virgin, fantasy virgin, that he wanted to join the top experts league and see how he could do if he assembled um, better information or, or worked harder in order to compete. So um, I, to be honest, I, I, <laughs> I wasn't really thrilled with the idea, but I, uh, I, I passed it along to some of the other members of the uh, of Tau Wars and said, now what do you think? Do we give this a one a one year shot just for the hell of it? Uh, if this book comes out and it's well, it does well, maybe we'll get some uh, promotion out of it. Maybe we'll get some exposure. I mean, he is with the Wall Street Journal, so maybe we should try this. Um, so we decided to go ahead with it, and uh, Sam did his whole. Uh, he he he, uh, he journaled his entire experience and participated in the draft. And uh, when the book came out, uh, I guess it was in two thousand four, um, two thousand five. I forget. Um, when the book came out, it was not like anything any of us had expected. He uh, it was hilarious. It was a wonderful read. Um, but he presented us as, as essentially guinea pigs for his project, and his descriptions of all of us uh, in some ways were caricatures, and some of us were more happy with it than others, uh, but it was, it was a great experience for him, and uh, he was fun to work with, and he was, he was fun to deal with, and the book came out, Fantasyland came out, and uh, it was a success. Uh, so people read it, read it, enjoyed it, and read about us, and uh, I, I was... Man, I was in like all these chapters. I think one of the chapters was all about my background and stuff. So it gave Tout Wars a lot of exposure. And I think a lot of ways it put us on the map. So if no other reason, uh, it was it was a, an experience we needed to have in order to uh, give us credibility and justify uh, what we were doing. And then he had sold the uh, the film rights to the book. So several years later, they did a, a quote unquote documentary. Uh, in a similar vein where they had a, a complete a newbie join uh, Tout Wars for a year and chronicled, chronicled his experiences uh, with a video camera this time. Um, and so Fantasyland the movie came out in 2010. Don't think it did quite as well, um, but uh, again, it was more exposure for Tout Wars, and, and that was always a good thing. Yeah, that sounds like great exposure. So yeah. in 2005, you got the Lifetime Achievement from the FSTA. Tell me about that. Yeah, that was nice. You know, it, you work hard at this, and um, for me, 
the uh, the feedback and the accolades is just the renewal rates. People coming back every year and finding the value. And, and if we keep renewal rates up, I know I'm doing got uh, a good job, and that's the feedback I need. Uh, but to be recognized by your peers, that takes it up to another level. And um, I I was really honored that uh, I was recognized in that way, and I really appreciated it. Yeah, and also the Fantasy Sports Writer Station, you're a Hall of Famer. Yes, there as well. Um, when they started doing their Hall of Fame, um, being recognized by writers, which is at its core, you know, when I'm, on my tax form, I put down I'm a writer. That's my profession. So um, that's how I consider myself and to be honored by fellow writers was also quite an honor. Uh, yeah. Congratulations on that. Anything else I've missed that uh, you'd like to point out? Uh, well, I mean, it's I since uh, I sold the company in 2008, slowly over the years, I've been pulling back little by little. And, you know, at, at age 62 right now, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my future and trying to decide what I want to be doing going forward. And, you know, the thing that I, I most enjoy doing is writing. And that's that's really what gives me pleasure at this stage of my life. So I'm looking for opportunities to uh, to continue writing in some way or form. So I've been doing some freelancing now. I've been freelancing with The Athletic, and uh, that's been a great experience. They're a great, great group of guys there. Um, yeah, I, I was freelancing with ESPN uh, prior to that, and they too. I mean, these organizations are just a great group of, of, of people uh, providing information to uh, to readers, and, and we're all just friends, and it's, it's great to have this community. Uh, but looking ahead, I, I've got these ideas for book projects that I really want to work on. And so I'm, I'm trying to position my workload between you know, the baseball forecaster and the conferences and this freelancing stuff so that I can have time to write uh, these books. So uh, this summer, for the first time, I have no commitments. And I'm hoping I'm be able to block out a bunch of time to start doing some uh, work towards these books that I've been uh, thinking about. Now, these new books, are they away from baseball or are they still associated with uh, sports uh i think i think at least the first few are going to have to be baseball related because that's that's my experience and you know, i've thought about a memoir of sorts but i don't know if, if i really want to write an autobiography I, but there there are so many experiences that are interesting and um uh i, I I want to do something in that vein, but there are, there are aspects to the game playing in, in fantasy baseball that I don't think have been explored enough. Some of the you know, psychological aspects, the economic aspects that I think are worthy of, of the treatment in a book. So I'm thinking about those. Uh, there's possibility of some fiction writing, but you know, I think even that is going to uh, somehow involve sports in some way. I mean, it's it's my life, so I, I think everything will ultimately, all the paths will lead back to uh, uh, that baseball stadium somewhere, I think. Well, that sounds very fascinating. Well, congratulations. You're, you're a true fantasy sports pioneer, Ron, and appreciate the time, and what a great career you've had. Thanks, Samuel. I appreciate you doing this. I think it's a great thing that you're giving some exposure to us pioneers like this you know we uh it's just another accolade that we really enjoy being recognized and uh you know it's been a lot of hard work over the years and and, and for you yourself i mean that uh, is, is somebody going to be interviewing you i mean that seems to make sense. <laughs> i hadn't really thought about that i i just wanted it just hit me not long ago where we don't there's no real thing where people can go and say hey here's the history uh, fantasy sports from a business perspective, mm -hmm. a little more than a player perspective, but both. So I just started doing it, and uh, we'll see how it goes. It's I probably should be working on my my websites and magazines uh, in February and April, but I just started to get this started. Who knows where we'll be? I'll, I'll probably end up doing many of these, but right now we're around 13 or so. But uh, we'll probably be 30 or 40, and I'll be tired of it. But thank you, and uh, well, hopefully pretty. it'll be something people will enjoy. And it'll really, you know, give us a good history. And uh, I think it's great to do the interviews with video because, obviously, I think you get more out of it, including the emotion and the feel of everything. Well, thank you for doing this. Uh, I know we all appreciate it. Right, well, thank you, and have a have a great season. Thanks. 2020. Hey, hey. <laughs> Talk to you soon.